Welcome to Science Foundations. Up next, we're going to be looking at the four states of matter, liquids, solids, gases, and plasmas. God gave us an amazing world. And in this world, we have matter. Matter is made up of atoms, which then form molecules, which make up everything around us. And so your body, my body, everything we interact with in the world, that stuff is all matter. What exactly happens if you heat or cool matter? It can change drastically in the way it interacts with the world. So I'm gonna give you a simple demonstration here at looking at the four states of matter. Often those are called phases and they go through what are called phase changes between states. We have solids, liquids, gases, and plasma. We're gonna come back to plasma later. So we're gonna start out by looking at the states of water. Now water is something we're all familiar with. It has a solid, a liquid, and a gas state that we see most every day. When you're talking about a water molecule, you need to think about the atoms that are in the molecule. We have two hydrogens and one oxygen. That makes H2O. When they combine, they look a little bit like a Mickey Mouse with ears on the top. In its liquid state, water has molecules that aren't really connected directly, but they are moving sort of slow around each other. That makes a liquid. That means a liquid can take any form. So we can take water and put it into a glass, and it'll actually take the shape of the container. Another thing liquid water does for us, which is incredible, is it allows life to exist on this planet by transporting and dissolving things between the molecules. Without that, and without the ability to have liquid water, life couldn't exist. It's a great gift from God. When we're talking about water then, in another stage, we have steam. If you add a little heat to liquid water, you get what's a gas. And it can come off as a steam and then form a gas. In its gaseous state, these molecules are moving fast. So instead of moving like this, it's moving kind of more like that. In the ice stage, which is the solid stage, these molecules are going to be moving a lot slower because they've been cooled. And so temperature and pressure can affect where these things are at. If we increase the pressure or decrease the temperature or both, we can take things from a gas to a liquid to a solid. In a solid stage, water actually forms a six-sided shape like this. When it does that, it forms ice crystals. Ice crystals like snowflakes have six sides to them. They're hexagonal as they grow, like a hexagon has six sides. All of that depends on the way the molecule is actually shaped and how it connects to the molecules around it. We're gonna take a little bit of time and explore another fun phase change. All right, so down below here, I have this. This is called a door of liquid nitrogen. And in this container, I have nitrogen that has been cooled and compressed to a point of becoming a liquid. When I pour this out, I'm going to have to have some safety equipment on. For one, I really need to have goggles. So I'm going to put those on to be safe. Now, I'm going to pour some into this little beaker here so that we can take a look at it. Remember, this is a cooled and compressed gas. Now, nitrogen, really, it's the most common gas in the whole world, and it is really cold. In fact, to be boiling like this, it has to be negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when it boils. That means anything that touches it could be frozen solid in a matter of moments. That's why doctors use it to get rid of warts. Oh, my goodness. Rock solid. Let's see what happens. Oh! Well, that glove obviously isn't nearly good enough. So here I have gloves that will actually protect me from the liquid nitrogen. I still have to be careful if it splashed on my body, it could freeze me. After seeing the hot dog that I used in the glove, let's take a look at what happens when we freeze an orange in liquid nitrogen. Has anyone back there got an orange? Oh, thank you. Oh, to do this though, we're gonna need to peel this thing so that we can check out just the inside. All right, here's our orange. Now to drop it into the liquid nitrogen. It's gonna freeze really fast because an orange has so much water in it that it's gonna turn to ice quickly. 
As soon as that's done, we're going to take a look and see what happens when we smash it with a hammer. Well, that orange is freezing. Let's take a look at what happens if we dump liquid nitrogen right onto this table. I'm going to try to trap it over here so we can see the bead boiling. So right here is the liquid nitrogen boiling off at air temperature. Eventually it'll disappear into the air, which isn't a big deal because the air you're breathing is almost 80% nitrogen anyway. All right, I think our orange is nearly frozen. So we're gonna pull this to the center. Oh, look at that. And we're gonna take this orange. We're just gonna give it one nice little tap with this hammer right on top here. Whoa, it really exploded. All that ice had frozen absolutely solid into a crystal structure. That orange works so great. Let's try out a few other things. Next, I think maybe we'll freeze a banana. So we need a bigger container and quite a bit more liquid nitrogen. We'll add our banana to it for a few moments. Now, I've heard rumors that if you freeze a banana solid with liquid nitrogen, it can actually pound a nail into wood. Let's find out if it's true. All right, I think it's getting frozen enough. It's feeling pretty hard. Yeah, that's convincing. So I'm gonna set this to the side. We'll grab a board and we're gonna get a nail. And we're gonna see, can this banana really pound in a nail? Well, not really. That didn't work so well, but you know, not all science experiments are successful. That's where we learn the most. Next, we're gonna take and do something that I know will work. We're gonna freeze some flowers in liquid nitrogen and play around with shattering those. Maybe we'll start out with just one rose. As this rose is freezing, all the water inside the rose is turning to ice. When we get it out, it's gonna be very brittle. So brittle, in fact, that if we take and tap it on something, it'll explode. Well, that was fun. I wanna try it with more roses. Let's do the rest of them. We're gonna need a lot more liquid nitrogen. And the rest of these flowers. Up next, we're gonna see what happens when we play around with frozen carbon dioxide, which is also known as dry ice. Carbon dioxide is the stuff you breathe out every day. There we go. Woo! So next, we're gonna take a look at dry ice. Dry ice is actually frozen, so solid, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the stuff you breathe out every day into the air. Now, dry ice looks a lot like regular ice, except for it's super cold. This is negative 109 degrees Fahrenheit. As soon as you set it out on a space like this glass table, it'll start subliming, which means it's turning from a solid to a gas without even hitting the liquid stage. That also means it'll do fun things like slide really easy. Whoa, there it goes off the edge. And we're going to take a look at what happens when you're dealing with pressure for a second, because this dry ice will completely disappear over time into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide gas. So I'm going to take a little bit and put it inside of these film canisters, and we're going to see what happens. Now, some of you may be wondering, what on earth is a film canister? Well, film canisters are ancient things of the past that your parents might be familiar with. They used to hold these little rolls of film that when exposed to light would capture images. So we're gonna stack up five of these. I'm gonna use my glove to put dry ice into each one, one chunk. And then as this dry ice continues to sublime, that's the big word for a change straight into a gas, it's actually going to fill the film canister with the gas, the carbon dioxide, and eventually, hopefully, shoot off unlike the banana experiment. Okay, while that's happening, 
We're going to get ready for our next experiment, which is trying to float soap bubbles from um, blowing bubbles on dry ice. To do that, I'm going to use a big container. We'll fill it with dry ice. And one of the things about carbon dioxide is, as you can see, not only is it cold so it sinks, but it's also dense. So when I fill this up with the dry ice, it's filling this container with carbon dioxide like a sea or an ocean or a lake. And we're going to attempt to blow a soap bubble that actually floats like a ship on top of this layer of carbon dioxide gas. Woo! Now, I should say, this is incredibly difficult to do. But every once in a while, we'll get one that sticks. There we go. There we go. If you watch these bubbles, they'll actually float right between the layers of clear carbon dioxide gas, which is down below, and then nitrogen and oxygen, which is here in our atmosphere. <laughs> Woo! Wow! After this, we're going to take a look at ping pong balls. What do ping pong balls have to do? Well, it also looks at how gases expand, and we're going to attempt to take ping pong balls and fill them with dry ice. But first, let's do another demonstration to show how when things change phases, they can actually expand or contract. Solids are denser and they won't take up as much space. Liquids take up more space and are less dense. And air around us, so gases, are way less dense. That's why they're filling up these film canisters and exploding them. And that's also why in a moment they're going to make these ping pong balls spin. Now we're going to take a look at how gases expand. So we're going to take and put the dry ice to the side. I'm going to pull out a flask and we're going to fill it with liquid nitrogen to see how it expands. To do that, I think I'm going to fill the liquid nitrogen using a beaker. Okay, when I add this to this flask, it should actually create a gas geyser straight out the top. So when you see it boiling in here, the gas is changing, right? So it's changing phases or states. It's boiling from liquid to a gas and coming out the top. That's the same thing or similar to what's happening as these dry ice bits are changing into a gas inside of those very scary film canisters. Now we're going to try putting a little bit of carbon dioxide, so dry ice, into this jar. And then we're going to draw a film of soap over the top in an attempt to make it inflate a bubble. There we go. Some soap. We're going to soak a paper towel with some soap. And then draw that across the top of the jar to see if we can get it to seal with a soap bubble. There we go. Aha! So as the carbon dioxide is evaporating or subliming off the dry ice, it's entering the bubble up here whew, as a gas. Let's take that gas expansion one step farther. We're going to try to fill a ping pong ball with liquid nitrogen. To do that, I've drawn fun designs on them just so we can see which way they're spinning. And I'm going to poke a small hole, which I've already done the others, in the edge of each ball. And then we're going to add those into a beaker. I'm going to take the liquid nitrogen and fill the beaker part way up. We'll use another beaker to submerge the ping pong balls so that they'll actually fill with the liquid itself. And then in a few moments, once we think they're probably full of liquid, we'll take them out and set them on the table and let them warm up and see what happens. All right, down below here, we're gonna put out a pan. That'll help contain the disaster. 
put these to the side, we'll pull out these ping pong balls and set them onto this pizza pan. There they go. So as the gas is expanding inside the ball, as it's evaporating, the gas is expanding, leaving through the little hole and spinning super fast as it enters the atmosphere again, propelling that little ball in a circle. So there you have it. One more thing I really want to try before we're out of time is making dragon's breath. At least that's what I call it. It's where you take and you heat up the liquid nitrogen so it evaporates very quickly and actually forms a cloud. To do that, I'm gonna take this liquid nitrogen again, which we still have from before, and let's add some animal crackers, shall we? So by freezing these animal crackers, just like the ping pong ball, some of the liquid nitrogen is actually gonna go into the cracker itself. Now, nitrogen is all around us, most life is made of carbon and nitrogen. So it's not something that's going to hurt me to actually eat that. Except for, of course, the fact that it's so cold, so I've got to take them back out and let them warm up just a moment. If you eat them when they're way too cold, that's not the best. So we're going to take this tongs, our animal crackers are looking pretty good, other than being, well, Pretty frozen. Now the secret is don't eat them so soon that there's still a lot of actual liquid left in them, around them rather. And when you put them in your mouth, this might freeze your mouth, except for you've already got so much warm saliva in there that it won't freeze your tissue, but instead will form a layer of gas around inside your mouth so that you don't actually get frozen. Here we go. So we're going to take a look at the last state of matter that we haven't talked about yet, which is plasma. Plasma is created when gases are heated way beyond what they normally would be, and it actually strips or freeze electrons off of the atoms within the gas. When that happens, they change the characteristics of them. In fact, plasma is the most common state of matter in the entire universe. The sun is almost entirely plasma gases. To show you what that looks like, we're gonna take a grape. I'm gonna take a knife and cut it in half. Then we're gonna put the two halves inside this microwave. And as they heat up, they're gonna get super hot right between the two halves. It's gonna actually create a plasma from the potassium on this grape, and it's going to create a little lightning bolt, so it's actually gonna show the electricity that happens within that plasma gas. So here we go. Okay, so we're gonna add a grape into this microwave that we've cut in half. I'm gonna use a piece of cardboard to cover the little light. This is an experiment you could do at home. Now, really I only need like 15 seconds, but I'm gonna go on ahead and add 20 to the clock here, 20 seconds, and hit start. And when I do that, in a moment, it's going to heat the area in between the grape and create a plasma that's actually going to light up like a lightning bolt. Woohoo! There it is, plasma. There we go, already. And our grape is now quite fried. And in the middle, you're going to be able to see that it has a burn mark where the plasma was actually formed. For the last experiment, we're just going to try to pile everything we've used together into one giant experiment. Now, you normally wouldn't want to do this, but I got a pretty good idea of what's going to happen, so we're going to give it a go. We're going to take, well, all of the dry ice we've been using, all of it. We're going to take a whole bunch of liquid nitrogen, whatever we got left, probably. Woo! And then, we're going to take, just for the sake of doing something kind of fun, 
some really hot water right here. You know what? Let's do this in a bowl. I think it'll be better. Oh, that'll definitely do the trick. Might almost be too much for that bowl, but we'll see. Now, let's take our really hot water and we're gonna add dish soap, because why not? How much dish soap? A lot of dish soap. <laughs> okay, now when I dump these in there, this is gonna make the liquid nitrogen and the dry ice go to a gas really fast, all at one time. And the dish soap should make the bubble stick around a little while. Three, two, one. Woo oh yeah. In fact, these are frozen bubbles. They're actually ice. And they're so full of liquid nitrogen that when you pop them, they give off steam clouds. I'm Joel Thomas. This has been Science Foundations, and we'll see you next time. Hi there, and welcome to this week of Science Foundations. Up next, we're gonna take a look at potential and kinetic energy. One of the things we're gonna look at are mouse traps and physical potential and kinetic energy. With a mouse trap, when you set it, you're storing up energy as potential energy in the spring. That potential energy could transfer to kinetic energy with one little mistake by a mouse. Ah! So first off, let's define the word energy. Energy is a property of matter or radiation. Now, one great example of something that takes energy is cleaning up a messy room. If you had a really messy room, not only would you have a great example of entropy, we'll save that for another lesson, but also you would have a fantastic opportunity to clean up that room for you and your parents. Cleaning a room takes both energy and a God-given intelligent mind. Whenever energy is being stored, we call it potential energy. It has the potential to do work. When we have energy that's being used, we call it kinetic energy. That's energy that is actually doing work. In this episode, we'll be covering both potential and kinetic energy, but first, let's start out with potential energy. Potential energy can be physical, if it's gravitational energy or elastic energy. And you could also have chemical energy, electrical energy, or nuclear energy. We're starting out with gravitational energy. It's one of the easiest ones to understand. To do that, let's get a ladder. So, gravitational potential energy increases with mass or position relative to the surface below it. This means if I lift something higher, it has more potential energy. Or if I get something that's more massive, like this egg, it has more potential energy because of mass and because of the position I put it to. So if I bring it up here and then I drop it, it will have more potential energy or at least more ability to make me work. Water is another thing that can have gravitational potential energy. Hydroelectric power plants work by storing water in a reservoir behind a dam, and then as the water builds, it builds in both mass and position, which means it has more potential energy the deeper the water gets. As the water flows out, it flows past turbines and spins them, which releases that energy as kinetic energy doing work. Another way potential energy is stored is in elastic energy. Elastic energy is stored when something is stretched. Can I get a hand? Thank you, random hand. So when I take this spring and I stretch it, I'm storing potential elastic energy. And when it's released, that energy is released as kinetic energy. Elastic energy can also come in the form of a rubber band. When it is stretched, elastic energy is stored. I got a great demonstration for this. Can I get my hat? Thank you. Ah! 
Turn and face me, you chicken. Nuclear potential energy is another way energy can be stored, in the nucleus of an atom. In an atom, just like in these marbles, there are different particles called protons and neutrons. When you have protons and neutrons together, the bonds between them hold a lot of potential energy. In fact, God made that strong nuclear force so perfectly balanced that it holds the whole world together. So when something like a neutron smacks into the nucleus of an atom, it has the ability to knock those protons and neutrons apart, releasing a ton of potential energy. Without a strong nuclear force that's balanced from an intelligent designer, the world would explode, implode, or who knows what plode at an individual atomic level. One way I want to demonstrate a nuclear reaction is by showing you this. We're going to call this a neutron. When it fires at a fast speed into the center of an atom, it disrupts the protons and neutrons, sending them in all directions. That's what a nuclear reaction is. In a nuclear reaction, you can either have fusion or fission. Fusion occurs when the atoms are fused together. Fission occurs when atoms are split apart. An atomic bomb produces a fission reaction, splitting atoms apart. When people think of energy, they usually think of electricity. So let's talk about electrical potential energy. Here I have a couple of AA batteries storing potential energy. This is both electrical potential energy and chemical potential energy because of what's inside the battery. This energy remains as potential energy until a circuit is complete and it actually lights up a load, or in this case, this little light bulb. So this allows the electricity to move through the circuit, making it kinetic energy. All right, let's take a look at static electricity for a moment. So I'm gonna blow up this balloon. This is something most people are familiar with. Static electricity forms when an object isn't grounded and actually loses electrons to another surface. In this case, my hair. Static electricity can do some work, like making hair stand on end, or making a balloon stick to other surfaces. So let's review potential and kinetic energy. When we talk about things like the egg drop, that egg at the beginning of our show had potential energy based on its position and its mass. And when it was released and moving, performing work, it became kinetic energy. Then the rubber band. When I pulled that rubber band back, it had potential energy added to it. And when it was released and moving and knocking the egg off the pedestal, that was kinetic energy. In a nuclear reaction, you have potential energy in the nucleus of an atom with the bonds holding protons and neutrons together. When those are broken, that releases kinetic energy. In a hydroelectric dam, you have potential energy stored with the water behind the dam based on its position, how deep it is, and the mass. When the water is released, it can power generators and produce electricity, becoming kinetic energy. With electrical devices, you have potential energy that can be stored in things like the battery, and when it's released as kinetic energy, it can power the devices and complete a circuit. In a chemical reaction, you can have potential energy stored in the bonds between molecules in different solutions. When they're mixed, it can release that energy by breaking bonds. It's not as powerful as nuclear energy, but it still packs quite a wallop. Perhaps the best example of kinetic and potential energy is in something as simple as a slinky. So most kids are familiar with slinkies, and if you take them to the top of a set of stairs, they have a high level of potential energy. At each level, or each step, that potential energy drops because of their position. Let's see what it looks like to take this potential energy and transfer it to kinetic energy. Let's take a look at the way chemicals can store energy or release it. First, I want to take a little bit of butane right here, which is in a gaseous form, and we're going to fill up a balloon with it. Butane boils off at just above 30 degrees Fahrenheit. That means I could touch the liquid with my hands and only be moderately cold. Unlike liquid nitrogen or other liquid gases, even propane is much colder. So inside of this balloon right now, I have both the gas, which is boiling off, and also the liquid at the bottom. That liquid will boil as it heats to room temperature. I'm going to make it boil a little faster by holding it in my hands 
and it will inflate the balloon with butane gas. Butane is a volatile gas. That means it expands at room temperature. Usually volatile gases also produce really nice explosions because they store energy very well. Whew, it's not evaporating quite as fast as I would like. It's still pretty cold at 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Whew. Ha! Oh, that did the trick. Look at how much bigger it got. Okay. We're going to clip this onto this chemistry stand and light it off using a little torch. To do this safely, I need to remove all other volatile chemicals. I'm also going to need a yardstick. Thank you. This is to keep me safe. I don't want to be very close to this balloon when it goes off. So currently, the butane in this balloon is storing chemical energy. That's potential energy. When I heat it with a flame, it's going to release that energy in the form of heat and light. The heat from this will come in contact with the gas inside of the balloon, which is storing potential energy in a chemical form. When that happens, it'll release that energy and explode. Here we go. Holy smokes! That last one worked so well. Let's do another butane experiment. In this experiment, I'm going to take butane and I'm going to fill a ping pong ball. Now the liquid inside the ping pong ball will be expanding into a gas. As it expands, the ping pong ball will spin wildly and who knows what will happen after that. Let's light up the torch. That'll give us a source of ignition. Then I'm going to put on a glove for safety. And fill the ping pong ball. Inside of here, I can see the butane filling up as a liquid. Once I get most of the way up, I'm going to set it out onto that pizza pan with the open flame. Three, two, one. Woohoo! In this episode, we looked at potential and kinetic energy. I'd encourage you to look for potential and kinetic energy in God's world all around you. From the water behind a dam to static electricity. This has been Science Foundations. Thanks for watching. Have you ever been to the fair and feel like you're going to be flung clean out of your seat on a ride? Today, we're going to be talking about Newton's first law of motion, next on Science Foundations. What is Newton's first law of motion? Newton's first law of motion states that an object at rest tends to remain at rest and an object in motion tends to continue moving in a straight line at constant speed unless an outside force acts upon it. In other words, once something is moving, it will keep moving until something else stops it or slows it down. What that means is that once an object is moving like this marble, it will continue moving because of inertia until something stops it or slows it down. What kinds of things can stop or slow down motion? So if an object stays in motion until it's acted upon by an outside force, what are examples of outside forces? Some forces slow things down more gradually, like friction can do that. Other times, things have stopped very abruptly. We're going to be looking at an abrupt stop with an egg in a little bit. So let's first talk about friction. What is friction? Friction is energy lost to a rough surface as heat. I'll show you what I mean. Right here, I have a board with four surfaces. Counting the glass table, we have five total to test. We have sandpaper, rubber, cork, and wood, and glass. So with those five surfaces, we're going to run a weight over each surface on a little scale called a spring scale, and it'll tell us how much force is being used to overcome the friction. On a spring scale like this, the spring inside stretches out when the bottom hook is pulled. As it stretches, there are graduations in newtons on the side. Newtons are a way we measure force. So the more force that's exerted on the spring, the farther down this part of the scale here goes, and it reads off at different points. Right there, it's reading at 4 newtons. To start with, 
let's use a block like this and maybe a medium sized weight. I'm going to just set this weight right on top of this block. We'll start here on the sandpaper side and I'm going to grab a scale from over here. So I'm going to pull here right there. We're about a half a Newton. Now if we go over to these other surfaces, rubber for example, that was sandpaper, we're close to a Newton on that surface with the friction between the block of wood and the rubber. Over here, we're just under half a Newton. And here on this piece of wood, we're almost indistinguishable. I can't even hardly read that. For our last test here, we're going to take this little block of wood and slide it across our glass. I can't even tell it's taking any force at all, but it is. Even glass has some friction. To make it more obvious, let's switch to a heavier weight. The more force being exerted between two surfaces, the more friction is created and the harder it will be to overcome. This heavy weight, which reads off at one kilogram, takes two and a half newtons to pull it across the glass, a lot more than the small weight. On the wood, we're coming in at two newtons. On the cork, we're coming in at four newtons. On the rubber, we're reading in at almost five newtons. And on the sandpaper, we're coming in at five and a half to six newtons. So this sandpaper has the most friction of any of these surfaces. This can explain why cars can slide when roads get icy and rough roads may allow more traction. More traction means that it'll stop much easier. So what happens if an outside force stops an object abruptly? All of the force of that moving object can be transferred into a mess. Let's find out today by taking this mousetrap, turning it into a catapult, and flinging an egg against that wall. Okay, we're ready. So I'm gonna set this rat trap first. I figure a rat trap probably contains, well, it can hold a lot of potential energy. That's a pretty big spring there in the middle, which is why I'm glad my fingers aren't in there. So we're gonna set this up by loading a potential energy into the spring. This is terrifying. Oh, it's a lot scarier than a mouse trap. And then we're gonna put the egg right there. Now we can either wait for a rat to come by or find something safe to set it off with. Perfect. I'm gonna hold the back end of it so the trap doesn't fly up in the air as much. Three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that again. The last time it didn't work because the string I used to hold back the hammer on this rat trap was too small, so it broke right through the string. I'm really glad my fingers weren't in there. This time, we're gonna use a chunk of paracord. It has a lot higher strength. Okay, I'm almost done with it. One more thing I kinda of wanna upgrade is the spoon. The last time, when it tried to fire off, the spoon bent under the weight of the egg and dropped the egg off too soon. This time, I want a better spoon. Check out that baby. Here we go. We're gonna tape it right here on the side and that should hold at least one, maybe three eggs. Okay, it's looking pretty good now. Now I'm gonna need another egg. Let's give it a try. I better set it first. Oh, load it with potential energy. Put the egg very cautiously in. I'll hold the back end again, just in case it tries to fly off the table with the whole trap. Three, two, one. <laughs> well, that didn't work. Let's try that again. Three, two, one. In our egg experiment, when the egg left the catapult, it hit the wall and exploded. It flew through the air until it was stopped by an outside force, the wall. 
So what are some ways that we can overcome friction? And is friction always a bad thing? Often, friction is actually a really good thing. It's what allows your car brakes to stop your car. It's what allows things to stop motion so they don't have to crash every single time. Friction can also produce heat. That can be good or bad. One of the things that we're gonna look at is how do cars overcome friction so that they can be more efficient? Here we have a little car. And we're gonna take a look, knowing that these all reacted differently with the block, let's take a look at what happens when we drive this little car on them. This car has wheels. So on each one of these, it's driving about the same, pretty well, because those wheels limit the friction in the system. That means the car can operate way more efficiently because of a wheel. Can we get even more efficient than a wheel? Probably. Let's try putting dry ice under this car. To do that, I'm going to need gloves. Dry ice, as we learned in another episode, is negative 109 degrees Fahrenheit. So anytime I use it, I need to be wearing gloves before I handle it. We're going to cut a chunk of dry ice off here. <laughs> now, because dry ice turns from a solid to a gas at negative 109 degrees Fahrenheit, as soon as it's out here in the air, it's already turning to a gas. That means it's subliming or sublimate. In fact, you can hear it sizzling on the surface. Now, that means as it touches the glass, this surface here is changing to a gas so quickly that it actually is creating a layer of gas between the dry ice and the glass. So this is floating on air. Let's put our little car on top and give it a try. That's pretty much almost a friction-free environment. In fact, if you think about it, this is basically what an air hockey table does. An air hockey table pushes air up under the puck, which allows the puck to float on a cushion of air. After watching how well the little car slid on the dry ice, I've been inspired to try it myself. I'm gonna put this big block of dry ice, a pizza pan, and myself right here. And we'll see how well I spin. So what exactly are the forces that throw you back in your seat at the fair? There's centripetal forces and centrifugal forces. Centripetal forces are forces that are seeking the center of the circle. In Latin, centripetus means center seeking. Centrifugal forces are forces that are fleeing the circle. Centra means center and fugus means fleeing. Centrifugal forces, though, don't actually exist. They are perceived. The only force that actually exists is centripetal force. Centripetal force holds you in so you feel like you're flying off. In order to illustrate centripetal and centrifugal forces here in the lab, I'm gonna show you a sling. In this sling, I'm gonna load a ping pong ball. Now, as I spin this in a circle, the centripetal force illustrated here is the center seeking force, which is shown by the strings holding the ping pong ball to my hand. Centrifugal force is what happens, it's a perceived force, when I let go of one of the strings and the ping pong ball flies off in a straight line into space. This has been Science Foundations. Remember, an object in motion will stay in motion until acted upon by an outside force. I'll see you next time. Hi, welcome to this episode of Science Foundations. I'm Joel Thomas. Today we're going to be taking a look at Newton's second law of motion. The year is 1666 and Isaac Newton is headed to the countryside to escape the Great Plague in London. While there, he's wondering how the moon orbits the Earth. 
In the countryside, he's sitting under an apple tree, and an apple falls from the sky and hits him on the head. This is probably just an anecdotal story for how Isaac Newton discovered gravity. It's been repeated several times, including by friends of Isaac Newton, but it's unlikely it happened exactly like that. In any case, Isaac Newton did create his second law, which states force equals mass times acceleration. Anyone got an apple out there? Oh! I said an apple! In the equation force equals mass times acceleration, we need to identify the units for force, mass, and acceleration. So let's take a look at those now. When writing Newton's second law, we put a capital F for force equals lowercase m, lowercase a. So that F that's written in a capital, that is in Newton's, which is written with a capital N. It gets its name from, well, Newton's name. Now mass, which is a lowercase m, is in kilograms. And acceleration is in meters per second per second. Or it's often written meters per second squared. That means we could write it out with the units instead to see what this equation looks like. Written out with units, force equals mass times acceleration would look like Newton's equals kilograms times meters per second squared. Now that we've identified the units for Newton's second law, we are going to use his equation to calculate Newton's from mass of an object here on Earth. Just like Newton did, well, anecdotally at least, when the apple fell on his head, we're going to use gravity, which has a known acceleration. Gravity here on Earth has a constant acceleration of about 9.8 meters per second squared. We're going to use that acceleration to calculate the Newtons when we know the mass of an object. To test Newton's equation, we're going to use a spring scale and a known mass. Our spring scale is here. A spring scale has grams on one side and Newtons on the other side. That way we can check our work when we're done. We're going to use this mass here, which when we put it on the spring scale, comes in at 500 grams. So we know 500 grams is the mass, and we know that the gravity on Earth works at 9.8 meters per second squared. Let's do the math. So in our equation, we're solving for force, and we know our mass and acceleration. Let's plug them in. Our mass was 500 grams, but we need that to be in kilograms. So that means we're going to have to take 500 grams and divide it by 1,000. The easiest way to do that is to simply move the decimal place over one, two, three times. So that means our 500 grams is going to become 0 0.5 kilograms for our equation. All right, so now force equals 0 0.5 kilograms times gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. So let's multiply 0 0.5 times 9.8. 4.9 Newtons. Let's check and see if that's correct. If we're looking at 4.9 Newtons, we can check that. On one side of the scale, we had grams. That's what we used earlier to measure 500 grams. When I turn it around, we'll see if it measures in at 4.9 newtons. And it does, it's right there above the five. It should absolutely amaze you that we can understand the world and predict newtons and force based on mass and acceleration. Gravity is so consistent at 9.8 meters per second squared that I believe it had to be put in place by a designer. Albert Einstein once said that the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it's comprehensible. In my opinion, God gave us a mind and made us in his image so that we can understand the natural laws he put all around us. Newton's laws of motion can be seen all around us. One of the places that they're very obvious is in traffic. So if you have cars in stop and go traffic, not only do you have irate drivers, but you also have a great example of what I call a Newton sandwich. So. Every time a car stops, you have an object at rest that stays at rest, Newton's first law. Every time a car moves, you have objects accelerating and then in motion. So the accelerating part is Newton's second law. 
Then as they're in motion moving, Newton's first law, objects in motion stay in motion, and then they come to a stop. An acceleration can be positive or negative. We call that deceleration when they're slowing down. So we have that again, Newton's second law. And then when it comes to a full stop, we're back to Newton's first law all over again. So we have first law, second law, first law, second law, first law. It's a multi-part sandwich. That means you have the first law, the second law, the first law, the second law, the first law. You could even make it a BLT if you add the third law, which states that for every action, there is an opposite but equal reaction. That would be a traffic accident. And remember, with Newton's laws, his sandwich doesn't come with coleslaw. Woo! All right. So I've got a scale here that can take my weight. In fact, it goes up to almost 2,000 pounds, it looks like. We're going to take a look and figure out how many newtons of force does my body exert because of gravity. Right now, I'm weighing in at 194 pounds. Let's do the calculation. First, we'll change that to kilograms. That's about 88 kilograms. So now, we're going to multiply 88 by 9.8. Anyone got a calculator? Perfect! So, here we go. 88 times 9.8 equals 862.4 newtons. Newton's second law of motion states that force equals mass times acceleration. One of the easiest ways to study that is using gravity because it has a constant force of 9.8 meters per second squared. I'm Joel Thomas. Thanks for hanging out with me. This has been Science Foundations. Newton's laws of motion changed the world as we know it. How did he know so much? Well, he recognized that for every action, there is an equal but opposite reaction. Whoa! So what is Newton's third law of motion? Newton's third law of motion states that for every action, there is an equal but opposite reaction. I'm going to show you this in three different ways. One, when something bounces off of a stationary object. Two, when two objects repel or push away from each other. And three, when one object smacks into another object and sends it flying. Let's take a look. Newton's laws can be seen all around us. They're especially applicable in sports. Things that you do outside, like football or soccer, but also things that you might do inside, like ping pong, billiards or pool, or foosball. Let's take a look here. Sometimes equal and opposite reactions may not look quite the way you think they will. In this case, when one object runs into another one, they actually do bounce off of each other. One bounces back slightly, or at least stops right where it is, and the other one will continue moving, so the energy will be transferred over to it. You can also see it if you add an extra one here, and this would be like croquet, and your croquet mallet hits this side and sends the other one flying. Another great example of an elastic collision is in Newton's cradle, well, named after Newton. In this case, when one of these red balls on the ends smacks into the line, the entire line transfers the energy and bumps the ball off the other end. And there's some strange things that can happen with this. So let's pull one way back and let it go and see what happens. So as you can see, equal and opposite reaction means when you let one ball loose on this side, this other side sends one ball flying. But if we let two loose on this side, two take off on the other side. And the same is true if we let three loose. So what happens if we let four loose? Is that even possible? Let's find out. If it's equal but opposite, we should see four fly off the other end, despite the fact there's only two sitting there. This also gives us an opportunity to look at what happens if we send them from either side running into each other directly. 
So I'm going to send these four up. Maybe these ones over here. I'm going to take these two here on the end and let one run into the other, which will do probably what you expect. If we drop them towards each other at about an equal height, the kinetic energy, the moving energy, is going to run into the other one and transfer straight across to send the other one flying. So in that case, the energy is actually switching sides. The energy from this object is moving to this one and bouncing this one back while this one is bouncing that one. Newton's cradle can also be used to look at pendulums because this right here is a example of a pendulum that swings. When it's pulled back, it has potential energy. As it's released, it has kinetic energy. And then it reaches a point right here where it wouldn't move at all if it was set there, which is equilibrium. So we have potential energy, kinetic energy, equilibrium, kinetic energy, potential energy, kinetic energy, equilibrium, as it swings back and forth. So when you start a Newton's cradle, it may seem like it violates the first law of thermodynamics. That law states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. But eventually, they slow down. So where did the energy go? When they reach that equilibrium point and stop, the energy has been lost in stretchy cords. It's been lost in resistance in the air. And so because this is not a perfect system, they won't continue forever. If this was a perfect system, it would exist in a vacuum and have no resistance or friction based on the cords hanging it. So when two objects run into each other, you can get an elastic collision. An elastic collision, as in the case of these two pool balls, when they hit, the material inside actually compresses just slightly, and then they'll bounce off of each other. That is also obvious when you take two objects like this table and this basketball and dribble it. This is another example of an elastic collision. The basketball is compressing slightly when it hits here, just like a Super Bowl would, but on a bigger scale, and then bouncing up in the air. So let's get another thing that really demonstrates this. That'll work. So when this bounces, I'm going to do it in slow motion for you here. And it goes down. It compresses. And then it bounces back up. That's an elastic collision within a pretty immovable object because this table is sitting on the entire mass of the planet. Let's have some fun with an elastic collision. In this case, the basketball is going to be on the bottom. And we're going to put a tennis ball right on top. So they're both going to compress to the ground and then the extra mass of this basketball is going to fire this tennis ball off way higher than you think it should. This is the same principle that's behind people on a trampoline shooting people to the moon when they jump at just the right time. Here we go. Woo! That go pretty good. Let's try two. Really high? Yes. That did the trick. So here we have a gigantic version of a Newton's cradle. In this case, we've drilled into bowling balls and secured eye hooks so that we can show you equal but opposite reactions through Newton's cradle. Let's take a look. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bowling balls. We're going to get it steady to start with. And then we'll take one end and let her fly. Moving one back should release one off the other end. And it did okay. It stopped pretty early. Let's try it with two though. That is pretty fun, but one thing I'm noticing is with so many involved, there's a lot of extra room for error for loss of energy. Not that energy is being destroyed. This is going to tie into our next episode, but we're actually losing energy because our system isn't super efficient. So I think if we remove a couple of these and maybe take the number down to five, we'll have more efficiency and we'll be able to see this repeat longer. So if we want to take our system down to five bowling balls to make it more efficient, I got a plan. Here we go. One, two, three. Now we're ready. 
So with only five bowling balls, now we have less room for air. We have fewer variables. So let's pull one back and see how long it continues. It's a little better. What happens if we pull three back and leave two? Four back would, well, in theory, leave one. So I'm going to take one of these and set it over here. And I'm going to take the other one back here. And we're going to let him go on three, two, one. <laughs> Woo! Equal but opposite reactions. The easiest way to see equal but opposite reactions is to have two objects together with mass, and one throws or pushes the other one away. When that happens, both objects will push away from each other. You can really see this equal but opposite reactions with a bowling ball, if you're on a rolly chair. Here we go. Isaac Newton lived in England from 1642 to 1726. During his life, he had a profound impact as the father of modern physics and calculus. He considered himself a natural philosopher. What he meant by that is he studied the world around him to see how things interact and work. To me, that means he was studying God's handiwork in the world to find patterns pointing to a creator. Newton's first law, which was object in motion stay in motion and move in a straight line, or objects at rest stay at rest unless they're acted upon by an outside force. The second law, which was force equals mass times acceleration, and the third law, which is for every action there's an equal but opposite reaction, come together to show how the entire world works and how everything moves. So in 1760, after Newton's death, those three laws laid the foundation for the Industrial Revolution. Another example of equal but opposite reactions is in a balloon rocket. Other rockets use the same principle. When mass is pushed out the back end of a rocket, the rocket is propelled forward. So that's equal but opposite reactions. To do this at home, you can tie a string between two set points and then connect a straw to a balloon. Duct tape is the easiest. Cut the straw a little short. This is going to make the nozzle for the rocket. Fill up the balloon. and then tape the balloon onto a straw already on the string. Here it is. A little bit of tape. Right onto there. Now when I release the air inside of this balloon, it's going to actually fly forward because at the back end, the air is leaving through the nozzle which is going to create an equal but opposite reaction with air going one way and the balloon going the other. Here we go. In the next episode, we're going to wave goodbye to Newton's three laws and welcome in the laws of thermodynamics. We're going to study how that had a profound impact on the Industrial Revolution starting in 1760. See you then. Today we're going to be studying the first law of thermodynamics. Let's test it out with this Pringles can rocket. Here we go! Woo! The first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So where does all that energy go that was in that rocket fuel? Well, a lot of it gets lost to the environment as heat, but that doesn't mean it was actually destroyed. Let's take a look. Because energy cannot be created or destroyed, the amount of energy in the universe today must be equal to the amount of energy when the universe was created. Often, when scientists talk about origins of the universe or origins of life, they consider evolutionary theory as the way that life began. The idea behind the Big Bang is that nothing existed and suddenly out of nothing, an explosion happened, propelling everything into existence. 
Then after that, life evolved on planet Earth. Often, people disagree over the theory of evolution as an origin for life. Some people think that if evolution happened, God didn't exist. And if God does exist, evolution didn't happen. I believe the best proof of God's existence can be seen all around us. Well, maybe not exactly seen. It's the things that you can't see or can't touch that may prove God exists from a science perspective. Things like, well, the law of thermodynamics. The fact that energy can't be created or destroyed, that means a creator must exist, not governed by the laws of thermodynamics, something beyond what we fully comprehend. A creator like that could have created energy out of nothing and put in place the laws that govern the universe today. In the year 1850, the Industrial Revolution was well underway. People were using the three laws of motion that Newton created, and they were beginning to fine-tune the efficiency of machines. This means controlling how much energy gets lost as heat. For that reason, the laws of thermodynamics really came into play. Two people were credited for creating these laws. One was Rudolf Clausius, and the other was William Thomson. He's also known as Lord Kelvin. To look at the laws of thermodynamics today, we're gonna to start out with the first law, which as we stated before, the first law states that energy can't be created or destroyed. So the amount of energy in the universe now is the same as when God created it at the beginning. No more, no less. Perpetual motion machines have been a goal of inventors for thousands of years. When the first law of thermodynamics came out, that's when we should have all realized it wasn't even possible. A perpetual motion machine runs forever without any energy input and can do a task. Let's see if it's possible. Let's build our own. To do that, we're going to need a block of wood, a paper plate with a hole cut in it, some pop cans, fuel in the form of butane gas, and a pinwheel. First thing I want to do is create a surface to attach these pop cans onto. Duct tape is man's best friend. So, because of our pinwheel, we've limited the amount of friction at play in the system. So, this center now has a little axle that'll spin fairly evenly. What I want to do now is figure out how do we fuel this? I got a couple ideas. One is to use butane fuel, like you find in a lighter, to run this machine. To do that, we're going to need canisters with a small hole poked in the bottom, like a little rocket engine. You don't want to know how I poked all these holes. It didn't go so well. Now that we've got the holes popped in the cans, we're going to fill them with butane gas, and this little hole will become the rocket nozzle. Because energy can't come from nothing, we're going to use this butane fuel, which is full of energy, to fill up a can. Butane like this boils at about 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's pretty flammable. I'm hoping it'll be a strong enough engine to propel our perpetual motion machine. Now that our rocket engine is almost full of fuel, we're ready for launch. Let's test one engine by itself. It blew itself out. There we go. So this little rocket engine right here is going to fuel our perpetual motion machine. Every time it spins, it's going to put out a more violent flame. As the rocket fuel burns, it's being expelled out the back. Because both the fuel and the can, or the rocket, have mass, when the fuel is expelled out the back, it pushes the can forward. This is Newton's third law, equal but opposite reactions. So we're going to mount our pinwheel here. And then with a little hole in the cans, we're going to place those so they all face the same way so the little rocket engines go off one direction. We'll see how we do. That means we'll put that there. We're going to fill each can with a little bit of butane. This will take a second. Okay. Now it's time to tape them on to the pinwheel. Let's do this. It's going to be super important that all of them are facing the same direction. I think we're ready. Here we go. We're going to light these and we're going to send off the little jets of fuel. Three, two, one, one at a time. Woo! Me 
relit. There we go. Not too bad. Whoa, I hit it. Woohoo! Wow. Well, that did pretty good, but it sure got hot over here. Look at all that heat. It burned our plate. However, it wasn't a true perpetual motion machine because we would have had to keep adding energy. Eventually, they ran out of fuel and stopped. Let's review what we've just learned. According to the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. That means a perpetual motion machine isn't even possible because it would require creating energy from nothing. In the case of our rocket pinwheel machine, our energy was coming from the fuel inside of the can. As it spun, it pushed the can forward as it burned fuel out the back. This was not perpetual motion. We were using energy already in existence within the fuel. However, lucky for you, I do know how to make a perpetual motion machine. The secret is all in the math. If we take a pinwheel and we put nines on this side, of course, I learned in school that nines are always bigger than six. That means the wheel will always spin this way with the nine sinking and the six is rising. This creates a true perpetual motion machine. That's all for this episode of Science Foundations. I hope to see you next time. Wait, wait, don't show them that part. Welcome to this episode of Science Foundations. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at how heat flows from one object to another. This is the second law of thermodynamics. So in this case, what we have here is ice cream that is taking in energy from the world around it. That energy is in the form of heat. That heat melted the ice cream and made a disaster. A really tasty disaster. So what is the second law of thermodynamics? Often called the law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics explains why heat flows from an area of higher temperature to an area of lower temperature. So if you remember from previous episodes, we already looked at the first law of thermodynamics, and we looked at Newton's laws of motion. Newton's laws of motion happened, then the Industrial Revolution happened, and towards the end of the Industrial Revolution, that's where people became concerned with efficiency, and that's where the laws of thermodynamics came. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy can't be created or destroyed. So this second law explains how energy or heat travels from one thing to another. So what exactly does it mean when heat flows from one object to another? Well, I'm gonna show you with water. So by putting this thermometer in here, we're gonna be able to take the temperature. Right now, we are at 70 degrees Celsius, or it looks like 100 and 59 right now degrees Fahrenheit. So that's some pretty warm water. We're gonna take an ice cube and drop it into that water in just a moment. Got the ice cube, and I've got one more cool thing to share with you. Right here, I have an infrared camera hooked up to this iPhone. It can detect heat. It detects heat and shows it in different color temperatures. I'll show you exactly what I mean. You can even see the different temperatures on my own face which is pretty awesome. Because it's so sensitive, we're gonna be able to use it to tell where the ice cube is, like this ice cube in my hand right here, or where the hot water is over here in this beaker. So I'm gonna drop this into the beaker, but first let's check the temperature one more time. Currently the temperature is at 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Here goes the ice cube. Right now the ice cube is melting away because the heat, the energy in the water is transferring or flowing into that ice cube. Oh, it broke in two. And as it flows into that ice cube, it's melting the ice and the solution is reaching equilibrium, which means it's balancing out. The cold and the hot are gonna find a happy medium. And the ice cube is melted just like that. Our temperature now is 158.
degrees Fahrenheit. So I want to know what exactly happens if I add more ice? In theory, more ice is going to, well, have more heat flow out of the hot water into the ice and melt it, cooling off the final solution. We're going to take a look at that right now. Let's take a bunch more ice, which is over here. You can see it in the bag, all that deep, dark, black, purple. And right over here with the hot water, oh, the hand looks cool on that, doesn't it? Over here in the hot water, I'm going to take a handful of ice cubes, and I'm going to drop them in. Our temperature right now is 164 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, that ought to do the trick. Let's take a moment and see what happens. Right now, we've dropped to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. We've already dropped 34 degrees. And it's cooling fast, though I gotta tell you, those ice cubes, they're melting fast as well. Temperature is continuing to drop. We'll put a few more. So anytime you think about heat, what I want you to think about is energy. The second law of thermodynamics tells us that it always flows from an area of higher energy to the area of low energy until the two are in balance. They've reached equilibrium and are the same temperature. Right now we've dropped to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, it should be cool enough now that I can stick my hand in there. Oh, it's like warm bath water. It feels real nice now. So it'll reach a point at which the ice and the water become the same temperature and all the ice is melted. You might be wondering, where does the energy go that was in the water that melted the ice? And how come it all cools down? Well, what happened is, by adding the ice, we added more matter we added more molecules of water that had less energy. So the energy in the warmer water flowed into the colder water in the ice, melted the ice, and spread out. In this case, we added twice as much water to this beaker as what we started with. That means the same amount of energy we had in the beginning is now spread out across many more molecules. So I'm gonna take this thermometer and put it here in my armpit for a few moments and take our, my skin temperature, at least my armpit temperature. We're gonna talk about hypothermia, but before we can talk about hypothermia, we need to talk about what heat actually is. Heat is actually energy from movement. It's moving energy. So within an atom, there are protons and neutrons and other parts that can be moving all over. The more movement there is within an atom and between atoms and molecules, and between molecules, the more heat you have within a system. I can maybe show you this with my hands. Let's find out. If I rub them together for a good while, my cold hands might just warm up from friction from all this movement, at least the rest of my body should, to be fairly white at the palms. That sort of energy is heat caused by movement. Hypothermia is the absence of movement, whether at the atomic level, the molecular level, or, well, our level. All right, let's take a look at my armpit temperature. It's what all you kids are wishing you were doing at home right now. Right now we're looking at 92 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty good. Now we're going to see about trying to shield and keep that heat in. Whenever you start feeling cold, you probably start thinking about putting on jackets to keep the cold out. But in reality, cold is nothing. It's the absence of energy. What you really need to be thinking about is keeping the energy and the heat in. Right now, you can see me on the thermal camera and the different warmer parts of my body, right? A lot of our heat gets lost through our head and our armpits. And so you could definitely see that on the thermal image. We're going to take and put on a few different things like this coat to try to keep me warm. You can already see where this coat has gone. There is less heat being lost. I'll zip it up the middle. Now, if I was in a survival situation and I really needed to keep warm, we would need 
to put on extra things over my hands and my head because I'm losing a lot of heat through my head right now. The energy isn't actually going away to nothing. It's just going out into the air and the surrounding environment around me. So let's try this. Here's another blanket. We're gonna put this one over my head to see if we can hold in the heat. Can you still see me? I can't see you anymore. Did it work? I don't know, I couldn't tell. Some places sell survival blankets which are made of aluminum. The aluminum reflects the heat back to your body and keeps it in. I wanna know how well does that really work. But before we do that, I wanna unzip this coat a little ways and take my temperature again. This coat has done a great job of keeping the heat in and it's making me really way too warm. That'll be great for looking at this temperature and testing aluminum foil as a blanket. Woo! Right now I'm seeing I'm coming in at 95 degrees. That's getting mighty warm. I'm gonna get this thing off. Wow, look at my arms. They are really <laughs> white and warm now in that camera. When you're talking about heat, heat can be dangerous for a body if you lose too much of it. We call that hypothermia. Heat can also be dangerous if you have too much of it in your body. That can look like heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Both can be deadly. I'm gonna take a piece of aluminum foil now and shield my arm to see how that reflects or maintains the heat in my body. So here's my arm. And when I pass the aluminum foil in front, it really does a great job of shielding me from that heat loss. In fact, in the thermal camera, you can't even see that my arm is warmer than the environment around it. So what about a really cold environment? How do scientists or recreational divers survive in really cold water? They use really thick undergarments and really fantastic insulating wetsuits or dry suits. I'll show you exactly what I mean. Inside of here is an insulating undergarment for a dry suit. This is made out of fleece. It keeps you warm even when it's wet and it holds the heat in really well. When I hold it up against my body, you can see on the thermal camera that it's all dark and the rest of me is pretty light colored. If I was gonna get in really cold water, like 40, 50, 55, 60 degree water or colder, I'd want one or two of these on underneath the suit I'm about to show you. This is a compressed neoprene dry suit. It keeps me dry all except for my hands and my head. I'll show you how it works in just a second. This neoprene is the same stuff that a wetsuit is made out of, but it's been put into a vacuum and compressed, so it's a little thinner feeling. A wetsuit allows water in up against your body. It can keep you warm in the Pacific Northwest Ocean at about 55 to 60 degrees for maybe an hour. That's a wetsuit, and then you're starting to get shivery. A dry suit will keep you warm for hours in the water. This dry suit has seals, like a neck seal, and wrist seals, which keep the water out and keep a nice layer of air warmed up against your skin. I'm gonna put it on now, and we're gonna test it out. Now comes the tight fit, the head. Ugh. I don't think that's what they mean by born again. All right, now you can see how well insulated I am everywhere else. A little bit of heat getting through, except for, of course, where I haven't zipped up. This part will be insulated soon enough. The zippers on dry suits were developed by NASA for astronauts, and they use them for scuba diving too. It turns out a lot of the equipment used in outer space can be used under the water and vice versa. All right, all except for my hands and my head, I'm ready to go. To get into really cold water, I'd wanna put on a hood and gloves. As you can see, I'm transferring a lot of heat. It's flowing out of my body from my hands and my face still. There's the gloves. And now, I'm ready for the cold. 
All right, to show you how well this insulates, I'm gonna hop inside this giant fish tank. Here we go. Now, I'm gonna take the temperature of the water as well. So I'm gonna drop this in. I'll check it in a moment. Now I'm gonna get in, but you gotta understand, I'm not so flexible and this suit is no better. Here we go. Oh, cozy. There we go. Ooh, yeah. That feels pretty good. Now, what temperature is this water? I'm seeing it's coming in at 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. That's pretty cold. That's about as cold as the ocean on the Oregon and Washington coast. But in this dry suit, oh, it feels so nice. After being in here a bit, I wonder what the temperature is inside of this dry suit. We're gonna put this down where my neck is. Oh yes. If this suit is doing what it's supposed to do, it's gonna keep the heat from transferring out of my body. It's gonna keep the energy from flowing into the water and the environment around me. In other words, it's gonna slow down the action of the second law of thermodynamics. Ah, oh, there we go. 75 degrees. That's a good 15 degrees warmer than the water around me. That's not too bad. I'm Joel Thomas. This has been Science Foundations, and I'll see you next time. Does anyone have any bubble bath out there? This week on Science Foundations, we're taking a closer look at the third law of thermodynamics. What is it? The third law of thermodynamics explains that it's impossible to reach the state of absolute zero temperature. To put this third law into context, we need to consider the first two for a second. The first two laws were created in the mid-1800s and published in about 1850 by two different people. The first was William Thompson. He's also known as First Baron Kelvin and Rudolf Clausius. These first two laws explain how heat, which is energy, is transferred. It's not created or destroyed. The third law of thermodynamics wasn't written until 1906 by Walther Nernst. He was a chemist and he understood that absolute zero on the Kelvin scale meant there was no energy present in the system. So what is absolute zero? Absolute zero is really cold. That means on the Kelvin scale, which is named after the first Baron Kelvin, it's zero. That temperature is equivalent to negative 273.15 degrees Celsius or negative 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit. That is unbelievably cold. In order to understand absolute zero, we need to know what's happening at the atomic level. I've got an illustration for you down here. Here I have pool balls and a bowl. These pool balls are gonna represent the inside of an atom, the nucleus. Here we have protons and neutrons. Let's put a few in. There we go. When things are colder, the nucleus of an atom moves a little slower. Energy is movement that produces heat. So when we're talking about temperature, we're actually talking about movement. At the atomic level, it's the inside of an atom where the protons and neutrons are moving around, staying together, but moving around. So something that is cooler will have just a little bit of motion inside of the atom. The protons and neutrons will be moving around some. When an atom heats up, the movement inside the atom increases, as does the movement between atoms. If something is really hot, it's gonna move a lot. 
And when something is really cold, it might barely move at all. When something reaches absolute zero, it means that all movement within the atom has completely stopped. Scientists would like to reach absolute zero, because if we can stop all movement in an atom, maybe we can get a better picture of what it actually is made of. Let's see how cold ice is. It's something we encounter on a regular basis. Here I have some cold water, and we're going to put some ice in it. Now, ice is something that freezes and melts at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius. This is fresh water so far. And that means it's going to cool the water in this beaker to about 32 degrees Fahrenheit over time. Let's check to see if that's correct. So far, the coldest thing on planet Earth has been a cube of copper. Scientists were able to cool it to 6 millikelvins above absolute zero. That's really cold. It really raises the question, is it impossible to reach absolute zero? With new laser technology, scientists are actually getting really close to reaching absolute zero. They're using lasers to remove heat from a system. Let's check back in with our ice water. So freshwater ice has cooled down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, right where it should be. I want to try something else. I've heard that salt water is colder than fresh water when it freezes. Is it true? Well, I've got salt and I've got ice. We'll leave that there for a second and check back in. In other episodes, we've used liquid nitrogen or carbon dioxide to get things really cold. How cold are those? Well, if we remember back, liquid nitrogen is negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit and dry ice is negative 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really cold, but still nowhere near the negative 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit we'd need to reach absolute zero. All right, we've got the salt dissolved and our ice has been melting. What temperature did we really get to? Salt water usually freezes at about zero degrees Fahrenheit, so we should have been able to get close to that. Let's check. Right now, we're coming in at about 19 degrees Fahrenheit. That is not nearly as cold as I'd hoped for. Why weren't we able to get down to zero? Well, it's the same problem scientists encounter when they try to reach absolute zero in a lab. In order to reach absolute zero, there can be no heat input from the environment. Because remember, the second law states that heat will move from areas that are warmer to areas that are colder. So the colder you get a place, the more energy or heat tries to transfer into that location. In this case, we have a warm table underneath and warm air around the outside of this beaker. That is transferring heat, or heat is flowing, into the beaker all the time. We would need a really good vacuum chamber to even have a chance of getting down to zero degrees Fahrenheit with this salt water. We're gonna make something special in the lab. We need a bowl. And our ice, ooh, this is actually frozen ice on the outside now. We finally hit the temperature that it started to freeze the water vapor from the air. We're gonna pour this ice water and salt into there. We're gonna need to measure a few things for ingredients and get a new beaker to put a few things in. We're gonna need more ice still too, cause that, that's not full enough. Don't worry, I got more ice. Maybe that much ice? Oh yes. Now, I'm gonna put this to the side after putting some salt in it. We want it really cold. And now it's time to mix a few key ingredients into this beaker. We're gonna need to mix some sugar. Anyone got a spoon out there? That's way too big. Oh, come on. That's better. Okay, we need a beaker. We'll turn on our scale and tear it or set it back to zero. Now we need to add some sugar.
15 grams? Mm, nah. 18 grams, getting closer. 20 grams of sugar. Excellent. And we need some vanilla. I don't know about you, but I really like vanilla. 10 milliliters. There we go. Last but not least, half and half. One hundred. Two hundred. Three hundred. Put this in and stir it extra well. How cold can we get it? Well, probably not below zero degrees Fahrenheit since our ice can't go below that even with the salt. We'll take a temp. To make this really good, we have to stir it constantly as it starts to freeze. Right now our temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit and it's gonna get a lot colder. Well, we did get it really cold. It's cold enough that it actually froze ice onto the outside of our container. There it is. So it condensed and froze ice on the outside and it's cold enough that it did what it should on the inside. And in here, this is now really nicely frozen. So what we see here is that we got cold, but how cold? It's dropping, it's dropping, we're passing 30. We are down at 29 degrees Fahrenheit. That means our ingredients are nicely frozen. Time to enjoy. Now it's time for the big spoon. Mm. Oh, I love ice cream. This concludes our study of the three laws of thermodynamics. If we remember back, the first law stated that energy cannot be created or destroyed. The second law stated that energy travels from an area that's warmer to an area that's colder. That's how heat warms cold things up. And then the third law stated that things can't reach the temperature of absolute zero. Why? Because of the first and second law. Thanks for joining me on Science Foundations. I'll see you next time. Oh! Seriously, guys, I need a towel.